Hi, I'm Bob McCauley, Superwire TV, and welcome to another episode of Around Leisure World. And we have a, a very distinguished guest here, and she is a guest at Leisure World for with uh, Yvonne Darwella, who's a shareholder here. Linda, uh, how long have you known Yvonne? Oh my goodness, it seems like forever. She is just such a wonderful person. Actually, probably we met in the mid-90s, I would say. So, um, having said that, what I'd like to say today is that uh, we have a presentation of two things. One is, can a scientist be a Christian? Or, I guess another way to put it, can a Christian be a scientist? Okay, and the second thing is, we're going to go over a book, Parallel Inter Inter Universes, a memoir from the edges of space and time. Okay, Linda, what I'd like to do to start with is, can you tell us how you got into the scientific business? Seems like I was born a scientist, or always wanting to be one. Um, I grew up in, um, in Pasadena, um, Oh, what a place. Yes, indeed. The home of Caltech, the home of Jet Propulsion Laboratory. My parents moved when we were very young to the United States from Canada. And here in the Pasadena Unified School System at that time, the education I got was profound. And I was years ahead, started school, college at the age of 16. So you had friends in school that, whose parents were in JPO? Um, not yet, no. I, first I had to prove myself um, I as an undergraduate at, at, at University of Southern California. But indeed, I started college at 16 with a wonderful department of astronomy at USC. And I was so privileged to have the chairman of the department as a lifelong mentor and friend after we met when I was an undergraduate there. And he felt that Jet Propulsion Laboratory was a place where I belonged. And he was doing some contract work at the time, the University of Southern California, supplying pictures of the moons of Jupiter so that when Voyager arrived, the Voyager spacecrafts arrived at Jupiter, then we could do high accuracy navigation there. And so it, it's USC's contractual work with Jet Propulsion Laboratory to provide some images of the moons of Jupiter taken from Earth. And there are four large moons. And those images really help provide um, something called ephemeris data. So we really knew to a high accuracy where they were. In Did you have orbits. a favorite moon? Um, at that time, I didn't, but I would develop one. As, mm -hmm. as, what as are the four, what are the moons it. of Jupiter? They are Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system. We didn't know that before we got to uh, to the Jupiter realm with Voyager. It's the largest, and Io had a secret that no one could have envisioned. Ah, uh, and you're going to tell us about that. How big would be Ganymede with respect to our moon? Um, basically, it is um, it is just slightly larger than Titan. The contest was between Ganymede and Titan. Nobody knew which was larger. Titan is the moon of Saturn. But I, I was fortunate enough to participate in finding the radius of Ganymede. And I don't want to misspeak and tell you exactly. It's been a while okay. since I thought about All it. Right. However, we, we discovered in real time during that mission that it won the contest between Gan between Titan and Ganymede. We didn't uh, know until we got there. Okay. Yes, and Io's size is... You mean our telescopes weren't that accurate? When you're this far away at the Earth, you're limited. That's why going to these missions, even if you're just flying by, is the thing to do. You take your telescopes, your cameras, all of your curiosity and all of your questions with you. And you learn so much, and then you have so many more questions open up as a result. Linda, have you studied what moons are and how they affect the, the, the planets that they revolve around? Absolutely. Our Earth, we are very fortunate to have such a large moon. And we think that moon was created, the moon that we see in the sky, you know, so often, and appreciate so much. We think it was created from a very large impact, maybe a Mars-sized body, had a grazing impact with the Earth early in the, in the, in the his formation history of our own Earth. And that material that was basically just pulverized 
off the crust and the mantle of the earth combined when, when basically hit that way with material from the object that, that hit the earth, this very huge giant impact. And eventually that material, we believe, coalesced into our moon. And really, it is so strange for a world like the Earth to have such a large moon. And really, the giant impacts, the, the impact in the early formation of the solar uh -huh. system are responsible for these amazing things. But right. because we have that moon, our climate was stable enough for us to develop. And so as life um, began to flourish on the Earth, there didn't come periods of time that were strangely, strangely, um, would not be as conducive to life for me. And, and be so you're saying there, there is a possibility that without the, our moon, yes. Yes. we would not have life on Earth? Well, we would go through very extreme, even more extreme climate changes than we have in the past. Mars is an example. With its two tiny moons, it is, it's been subject to enormous variations in its, the tilt of its axis, where our, the tilt of our axis mm -hmm. remains pretty much stable, so our seasons remain stable, and, and life as we wow. have it is accustomed to that stability. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then what you did discover, the, the difference between the moons on Jupiter, you started focusing on one moon. Interestingly enough, Io is about the same size as our moon, and it is... And you spell it? I-O. 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 I-O, I-O. <laughs> Indeed. Right. Okay. And it is about the same distance from Jupiter that our moon is from the Earth. When you compare the two, they are completely, completely different. Our moon is not geologically alive. It cooled early in its history, and it cooled because it's a lot smaller than the Earth. The Earth is still not high. geologically alive. What do you mean by Internal that? Internal heat, enough to drive geological processes. On okay. Earth, we okay. have volcanoes, we have the plate movement, <sighs> and we are very unique in that regard. But it all comes from heat that is escaping from beneath the surface of the Earth. And that heat is left a little bit left over from the formation of the Earth, but it's also from radioactive decay. So it wasn't exactly dead. Exactly. Well, the Earth is not, but the Moon is. It cooled so much faster that its geological processes ended a long time ago. So you're saying definitely the Moon is dead. Pretty with much. With respect to what you're going to tell us about the exactly. bio. Exactly. Okay. So when we, when we arrived at the Jovian system, I don't think that anyone could have envisioned what we were about to see when it came to Io. And Io itself is the most bizarre looking world it, we called it the moldy pizza out of the science. The what? The moldy pizza. Moldy pizza. Moldy pizza. Moldy. It looks moldy and it, it has blue tinges and oranges and whites. And when we first saw it, this, the scientists on the mission at Voyager were absolutely overwhelmed. They couldn't explain where were the craters. Now, something was covering over the impacts that all the bodies of the solar system Now, Linda, can you tell us a little bit about, you're telling me something about, yes. you started discovering yes. what environment you, were you in, mm -hmm. who was there, were, not yes. people, but yes. were there a lot of people there doing this? Was it just you? Mm -hmm. Were you looking at a telescope, not a telescope, of course, but were you looking into videos or did you see full stream uh, video type the, coming down? The spacecraft would take images and show us what it was seeing in the realm of Jupiter for two reasons. One was for science, so discoveries could be made. Yeah. And one was for navigation, so that we could use the pictures of what the spacecraft was seeing. Here's a moon, here's a star in the background, and basically triangulate and ascertain the position, the true position okay. of the spacecraft. So were you looking at photos? I was looking on a computer monitor okay. on images that had been sent from space, from the Voyager um, spacecraft and its camera, down to the Earth, the Deep Space Network, and then sent to Jet Propulsion Laboratory, displayed on my mini computer screen, and then I would process them. I was not on the science imaging team, I was a mission navigator. And wow. Yes. And we... So you could say, go this way, go that way? Fundamentally, that is the end product. Okay. Yes, based upon small variations from what you expect, where you think you are, those tiny variations that you see in the picture that differ
from what you where you thought your position ultimately provide the information and we do trajectory correction maneuvers. Did and you have any capability on the computer to do analysis while you were looking at these I most, photos? I most certainly did. Okay, and, wasn't and just you thinking of it. I'm, I'm looking at this picture and I'm and not seeing anything too unusual except it was already after the spacecraft had encountered Jupiter, the Jovian system, which means it was looking back over its shoulder. It was leaving. It was on its way to Saturn. The, you know, it's leaving that wow. realm. The encounter had happened. The scientists had announced exciting things. And basically, everybody had gone home and thinking that all the wonders that we were going to see at Jupiter had already happened. And I sat down to do some routine processing, a post-encounter processing, that we would use to, in this case, to improve the orbits even more of these okay. satellites. Okay. And I went. Did, did you go uh, around all the moons? Did you just pick these, on one? These were pre planned pictures based upon the, the, the spacecraft's position, its ability to see which moon at which time. In, in, in this case, since we were really looking back over our shoulder, the lighting conditions were not ideal. And Io was just a crescent, as often our own moon is just a crescent, the way it was oh. lighted by the oh. sun at that time. Oh. And we would have to overexpose these moons. So we've got this overexposed crescent, so you can pick up the dim star images. And special image processing had to be done uh, in okay. order to get those star so images. So the computer was helping you? Yes, it was. Uh -huh. And I had a very unique capability on this mission in that regard. And when I went to look for a star that I needed to find, it's, it's high accuracy position, I did some special some processing called a linear stretch, which really brings out the brightness um, of gotcha. certain features. And instead of seeing that star, I saw an anomalous crescent. This, 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 it looked like another moon behind Io. And it came out the moment I processed it. And I think that instantly I had a sense that I was seeing something that no one else had oh, wow. ever seen. The, nobody had seen Io. We'd the, seen Io, well, but we'd not seen whatever this oh, strange see. object was. I, I catch it. It okay. came out from the processing. Gotcha. And there it was. There was a strange, uh, strange object on Io. Off the edge of Io, correct. Wow. And really, it was so large with respect to Io. It was so large that one would think that it really wouldn't have anything to do with Io. It was 270 kilometers beyond the surface of Io. So it was huge. <laughs> and one would think, oh, it's another moon behind Io, or a camera glitch, or something Real tall like tree. That. You got it. And it would have to be. And ultimately, interestingly enough, we eliminated enough possibilities as I pushed this forward to say, yes, it did have something to do with Io. That was the only possibility left. And I tell that discovery story in this book for the first time in Parallel Universe. Can you show us that book? I sure can. This is Parallel Universes. This is my memoir. And minute to minute from the discoverer, finally, I do talk about how this discovery took place. Is that you on the cover? It is. It As is. how old were you there? I was, I'm thinking, I don't know exactly, you know, approximately two years old. And indeed, um, there's a lot on this cover. It tells really the various, various uh, topics of the is book. Is that the little special object yeah. there? Um, this is indeed, this, this volcanic eruption was in fact in the discovery picture, but it's not the one I originally discovered. Um, this is uh, Loci, it was eventually named Loci, and Pele is the one that I discovered, and it was over this very large heart-shaped feature here. So here is Pele. Oh, that is a heart. It, it looks like a heart. It is, it, it absolutely does. And the, the amazement, when the first time I ever saw that feature, I never forgot it. And it was a bit like I was gazing into destiny when I discovered the actual... So that's Io. Correct. And this is you. <laughs> was that, this book sort of something that you would have been happy to, if you knew you were going to grow up and write that book? At, I at would, I, you, you know... At the, an early age, you, yes. you wanted to become a scientist? Well, my story is very interesting. This, in science, and I am very much an astronomer and a scientist, and in science, um, Basically, 